Welcome everyone to the Lunch and Learn, tracking performance through personalized learning paths. Now there's a lot to unpack in this title. Tracking, how are we gonna do this tracking? Performance, what, are we, what kind of performance are we going to track? And personalized learning paths, why did that make it into the title? As we're about to see, everything ties in very nicely together. Why track performance? Trends, predictive insights, gap analysis, these are just some of the reasons why. There's a saying in a lot of industries that data is power. With data, stakeholders, managers, executives can make uh, predictive analytics. Uh, they can make business decisions. Uh, in a learning industry, in a learning department, without information, without data, without understanding our learners, without understanding how our uh, e-learning courses are performing, how can we make them better? How can we do our job better? Now, the question is, what do we track? Surveys are very common. At the end of a course, we survey, we're doing this right now uh, in, the, in the webinar. But in a e-learning situation where, you're in, where learners are interacting with the course, there are other ways that we could collect information. For example, the choices a learner makes in the course, the responses they provide when during an assessment, the sequences, which means we're tracking multiple actions, multiple activities in the course, that can provide us with valuable information. And the little byline under the image, learner metrics rely on objective data rather than opinion. I know in previous jobs I've worked, we did poll, we did poll our, our learning audience, we did do surveys, but the questions always came back as like, are they just telling us what they want us to, you know, to hear? They think they want us to know. So that's, that made the whole thing of surveys questionable with those results. But when you're actually tracking how a, a learner uses and performs during a course, the actions don't lie. Actions speak louder than words. A learning performance path. Prior to someone actually starting the course, they may enroll, be enrolled in a course. They may actually search for a course. Some LMS platforms have a recommendation engine based on AI and may recommend a course you know, to a roller, uh, to, a, to a user. So all these happen before they actually take training and there's a limited amount of information that we can get and track. And typically the platform that provides the recommendation engine or the enrollments will also provide tracking on that kind of data. Post-training, that kind of information can be analyzed either manually, a course can be built requiring user input that to collect additional information, or very often the LMS system may be integrated with an HR system to compile a, a, a you know, super information to provide more data. So uh, how does a learner's performance and score on a scorm based course compared to their resulting sales output on the other end. If you can integrate those, those two together, that provides valuable in input. But we'll, what we're gonna talk about today is actually how can we track learner performance inside a course? Why? Because there's an opportunity to collect ma many data points. The data points can be built into the system, built into the course, or they could be custom things that you make up. And on the right side of this slide, you see some examples. Do you wanna know if your learners are using the closed captioning that you built into the course? Are they listening to the audio? It's good to know because you put, you're investing time and effort into putting those things in. Are your learners actually using those? What learning styles in your particular audience are in demand? Is the course, do, do the learners find the course relevant? Are there any gaps in your content? Is your training challenging? Too challenging, not challenging enough? Are they skipping information? Are they asking for more information on certain things? And you may be thinking, can we really build courses to collect that kind of data? And the answer is yes. By the way, down below, I've got the uh, progress bar. 
So you can say you can see we've been through the introduction part. We've talked about performance. Now we're going to be talking about actions, and you can actually take a look and see the upcoming sections that are coming in a little while. Learner actions generate data. What kind of learner actions are we talking about? Whether they click on something or if they don't click on something. Hits and misses could be if, you, if there's a lot of choices and some are right and some are wrong. Sequences, the order someone selects on something, whether it be how, what answers they click on in a multiple choice, whether it be what actions they click on in a nice interaction you built into uh, the course. Scrolling and dragging, did they engage in those activities? How much time was spent or not spent on a particular slide? Text entry, you could actually you know, collect information from text entry fields. So for example, in, uh, I remember one course I built out, it was on elevator pitches and we had the uh, learners input their elevator pitch. We collected that and reviewed it. And one of the funny ones was the salesperson said, just buy it. And that was not the way we trained them, but it's nice to know that uh, some of the salespeople did have a sense of humor. I hope that was a sense of humor. And file uploads, we can even uh, track that. The point is every action that you build into an e-course can produce a data point. Let's show an example. And bring this right up here on the screen. So for another course that I did, another webinar, I was doing something on, on variables. So here, if we click on some cards, I did not pick a winning hand. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, it's uh, I'm seeing the actual cards I clicked on and the sequence I clicked on them. Jack, Queen, King, the 10, and the Joker. If I click play again, uh, let's see if I can get it right this time. We'll start with the ace. Ta-da! And I got it correct. And you see in the upper right-hand corner, I've got the sequence of the correct answers. What I'm showing you here is that every time I'm clicking, I'm creating a data point. So here, the data point is actually the sequence of cards that I'm selecting. And I could keep playing this again and again and generating different data points, but you get the idea. Learner actions generate data. So every action is a data point, as I just showed you. If you want to collect more data from your learners and about your course, you need to build more actions into your course. More actions require more choices. So in the example I just showed you, I had the choice of the 52 cards to choose from. More choices are in the personalized learning. Here's where you bring in the personalized learning paths. Courses do provide a certain level of uh, actions, a certain level of choices. But in a personalized course, as you're going to see very shortly, you can increase that many, many, many times over. Here we have a couple of common examples. Uh, the first example, choose a path. This is an example of a branching course. The course starts up, maybe gives a little introduction, and you ask the learner, uh, you know, what department are they in, whether it be sales or technical or leadership or whatever, or what product or what service they want to explore in this particular course, and they get to choose their path. The other option is a pretest, where you have maybe several chapters in a course, several sections in a course, and you give a little pretest. If they know everything on a particular chapter or a section, they automatically mark that complete and they don't have to take that. So both of these are going to personalize the learning. In the first uh, example of the branching, the learner can personalize the training and take path A, B, or C. In the second one, uh, in the results I show, they passed section two. So this particular learner would only have to take sections one and three. Another learner may pass number one and only take two and three, and so on and so forth. But after they make their choice, 
after they finish the pretest, the rest of the course is linear. Now I have a question for you. Based upon what I just showed you, how can you add more choices? If you have any ideas, drop them in the chat. Hey, Tham, can you answer a quick question for us? Yes, I can. What authoring, tool, what authoring tool did you use to build that card game interaction? Uh, I built it in EOB Learning's Lectura. That's my favorite program for a lot of reasons. But it can be built in any authoring tool. It's all based on uh, click actions or triggers if you're using Storyline and storing, and storing variables and displaying the variables. Okay. And you can always reach out to me offline and I'll get going into more depth on that if anyone wants to. All right, thank but you. Do we have any suggestions in the chat yet on how we can add more choices in this situation? I think I distracted everyone with my authoring tool question. Okay, but uh, I'll, I can answer the question if no one's jumping in. And I totally understand if people are having lunch, enjoy your lunch, settle back, and I'm hoping everyone learns something uh, during this time period. But what you could do in the first example of branching is partway through the course, you could have another branching opportunity. So for example, uh, this particular learner is, follow, is following branch B. Uh, you can actually have another option. Do they want more detailed information, less detailed information? Do they want to switch to a video mode? And then they could branch off in that track for the rest of the course. Now, you can put, depending upon the size of the course, you can put maybe two more branching questions in there. But let's face it, you're kind of limited. I mean, how many branching choices can you put in before this becomes, oh my gosh, I have to make another decision. I mean, you know, now I have another ABC question, decision to make. I have another ABC question to make. It, 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 you kind of limit it as to how far you can carry this. In the next example with the pretest, it's the same thing. You could actually mi uh, mix and match. So I did a pretest and partway. So in this example, that they're learning some uh, topic one, they're learning some topic threes. Uh, at any point, I could put in maybe a branching question and therefore uh, have more data points. And to make it clear, every time a user makes a decision, they're making a decision by clicking. And that decision can trigger an update of a variable and that variable contains the data as we're gonna find out. And that's the data you can collect and analyze. So all this, there's a reason for all this being uh, in this session. Now, here's an example of personalized learning taken to the max. And I call this the learner intelligence adaptive design model. Uh, there'll be a link coming up a little bit later on. It's something that I've developed. I've spoken a lot of times on it. Uh, basically, it's a way of building a course where the learner has choices on every single page. So in this illustration, each page is represented by the black square. And the orange and the green dots, they represent uh, choices, buttons that would be on the page for them to make a decision. Every time they click on that, uh, they would open up the corresponding next page. But the every, every next page also has the orange and the green. And so you can see as we go deeper and deeper into the course, uh, each page uh, has those options. Now let's back up for a minute. I just said previous in the previous page that you're limited. How many times can you put branching in? How many times can you put a pretest in? It's going to be very uh, burdensome on the user. It's going to destroy the whole learning experience. Not so when adaptive design model. The way the adaptive design model works is on every single page, you have the opportunity of a choice but you do not have to take the choice. So for example, uh, if I chose orange and on the next page I chose orange and the next page I, cho I chose orange, I don't have to choose orange. If I choose orange and I click the next button, I'm, I'm staying in orange. And all I gotta do is click next, 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 next. But if I'm going through a course and I decide to switch to green, that option is always there. Let me, get, 
show you another illustration. So here, one learner followed the red path. Another learner followed the blue path. As you can see from all these black squares, there are other paths to follow too. In actuality, the first page with two choices, uh, the first page provides two choices. Then these two choices, represented here by the red and the blue, each of those provides two choices. So two times two is four. So you can see the black and the red, the blue and the black, now it's four choices. As we get deeper and deeper into the course, there's more and more choices. So if anyone is mathematically inclined, you can multiply two by four, by eight, by 16, by 32, for as many pages that you have in your course. And that's going to, and that number, if you multiply them, is going to tell you how many possible learning paths there are through this course. But the learning experience is very simple. The choices are there for the learner to control how they want to see the next page, but the learner can settle back and just click next, 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 as long as they want to. Here's some examples that might make it easier for you to understand. If I wanna build one course that is going to service new hires in the company, employees have, that have been working for the company for a while, managers and executives, I mean, can you imagine an executive of the company, the CEO, taking a compliance course every single year. It's like, hello, can someone just mark me complete? I own the company, I run the company, I know everything about the company, do I have to take this? I would build a compliance course so that if someone took the course, they could go through all the pages on an executive level, not a lot of reading, not a lot, of, not a lot to do, just got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. But if a manager was following that high-paced path, and it landed on a page that talked about a new product and there was some acronym. And it's like, oh my gosh, brain freeze. I know we just announced this two weeks ago. What the heck is this? One click of a button and they could switch, they could move to the employee level, which has more information, or even the new hire level, which has everything explained from soup to nuts. And maybe a manager or an executive might do that, not because they didn't know the answer. But they want to see how you and I, as the course developers, how are we explaining that new product? A couple more examples. You could build one course that, that can service people with low, medium, and advanced experience levels. And if someone is on the advanced track and it's got too advanced for them, at any page, they could drop down to medium. At any page, they could go back to advanced. The user is in full control of the, how the information flows. You develop the content, but provide content that they can view at different levels. Another example, you could build one course that, that combines technical sales and support information because each of these audiences are gonna be looking at the same topic from a slightly different perspective. And if you put the different perspectives in there, a salesperson, some salespeople may want more technical information. And they want to, they want want may want to click on both. You could now we could personalize training for different regions of the country. We could personalize uh, the training for different learning styles: text, audio, video, interactive. Any questions? Have any questions come up? Yes, we do actually have a handful of questions. So one is: Would you recommend building these learning paths? Um, in an authoring tool like Lectora or inside your LMS, like the Rockstar Learning Platform or whatever LMS your organization uses? Okay, the adaptive design model I came up with is for an authoring course. Actually, very interesting is I first developed it in Storyline and years ago when Storyline first came out with layers and the process to explain the process is very simple. To execute it may take a little more work, but basically the process is uh, each of these levels, let's take experience levels, low, medium, high. I would make layers, a low layer, a medium layer, and an advanced layer for every single slide. And then when you click the next button, it will check a variable. If the, a, if the variable was set to A advanced, it would take me to the next slide 
with the advanced level active. If I click the button to, uh, to medium, it would change that variable to medium. So when I click to the next slide, it would show me the medium layer. So it's, it's, it's very logical. It's very systematic. You got to pay attention. But uh, that's how I started. In Lectora, since after I, I switched to Lectora, with a wee bit of JavaScript, it is slam dunk simple. Okay, I could share out a Lectora, a, a Lectora template. As a matter of fact, here's a free offer to people who are watching this video. If you're a Lectora user, or if you want to download a trial version and experiment with it, you tell me briefly uh, what, you, what you want to track and how many. Like the first one, you got new hire employee, manager and executive are probably, are probably the same, but I got four right here. I got three on these here. Uh, if you tell me uh, what the topic is and how many uh, variations you want to see, I'll send you a template like in two seconds in, you know, in, in Lectora. So to answer your question, this is best built on, a, on an authoring tool level. It can be done in any authoring tool. Some authoring tools, it's going to be way, way, way simple, like with the Lectora, a lot simpler, but it can be done in the others as well. Uh, you said you said you might have had other questions. Yes, that would thank you. That was an excellent answer. Uh, we'll do one more question and then I'll let you get back to your presentation. Do you use any specific storyboarding or mind mapping tool when you are planning out your branching scenarios? I do not. I mean, I might uh, do something in work like build an outline in Word, but what I find is. I typically have a start point and an end point in mind. And as I'm building it out, I find gaps and I start adding it to it. As a matter of fact, with this PowerPoint slide, I started with a Word uh, outline and then switched to the PowerPoint because for me, the graphics, the images and the graphics, they convey a lot of information. So where I got a lot of text in Word, um, representing that by images. And very often when I was building a slide, it'd be like, I want to say this, but I don't want to say it in words. I want to show it. So I actually had to go and build a lot of the graphics as I was building the PowerPoint, which is one of the reasons why Stephanie only got this PowerPoint done to you yesterday. <laughs> but no, I, I don't use any tools like that. It's just, it's just a simple outline and, and building it as I go. All right. Thank you. Okay, tracking performance with custom data. So here's a simple process. Number one, the learner initiates an action. Then we store, based upon that action, we store some data that we want to collect in a variable. And then the variable is sent to a Google Sheet for analysis. Now, if you're working with XA, XAPI and you have a learning record store, fantastic. You know, you've got some great tools at your disposal. Uh, you know, keep doing it. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is something that's available to everybody without having to uh, have a subscription to a learning record store, without having to learn any, any XAPI commands. Super, super, super simple. Using the skills that you're already using with actions, triggers, and, and variables, we could send uh, information to an external database, which is Google Sheets, very simply and for free. Asking me what tool I'm using? What this can be done in any authoring tool. And if you guys want to you know, email me, I could send you links to how to do it in the other authoring tools. But I love Lectora. And one of the reasons is that it's so simple to do the high powered stuff. So here's the, the Lectora secret Lectora can send any test and survey results to a Google Sheet. And you're saying, well, we're not talking about test results or quiz results, we're talking about my custom variables. That's right. If we set the question variables, remember every question has a default variable that's going to be sent to the LMS for grading. If we set the question variables equal to your custom variables, so remember that card game? If my variable is the ace, king, jack, queen, whatever sequence I clicked on near 10, if that's my variable, I could have a question that's a simple short answer question, which means it's a variable that's blank and empty. I set that, 
question variable equal to the uh, ace, king, queen, jack, 10. And now when the, when, when Lectora submits that survey to Google, it's going to submit that path from the game. Send survey results with your data to Google. Now, I have on the screen, and this entire PowerPoint is going to be, I believe it's going to be dropped into the chat. The entire uh, PowerPoint is available. But should you want to take a screen capture, that's fine. But this is a blog article that I wrote recently. It's got screen captures of every single step, and it explains this process in, in Lectora in complete detail. So rather than take the time, which I don't have today, to go through the entire process, it is a free template you could download. The blog article has a link to that. And it's super logical and simple. Do this once or twice and you'll be a pro with this. Tracking personalized data. Let me show you something else. I built this demo right here years ago, actually. Enter, the enter your name. So I'm going to put down LBX. How'd you hear about this course from a webinar? And now this is what, I'm what I was talking about earlier. So I'm gonna start off, you could consider this branching right now. So I'm gonna uh, see that, let's say lots of us are, are designers. I'm gonna click designer. And now you can see down here, I'm on page D1. Now I purposely named this page D1 for a reason which you're about to see. So I'm on page D1. And if I click the next button, I'm seeing D2. And what that means is, it means I'm learning about the subject matter because I chose a designer's perspective. But now I'm also a bit of a programmer. So if I click on programmer, what do you think is going to happen? Am I going to go back to the beginning of the course? No. I'm on page two. I click on programmer. And now I'm on page two of program, which means if I was so inclined, I, if, if this is something that I thought was very important to me, and I want to, and I and I need to sell this idea to my manager. What's in it for my manager? So I click on manager and I'm still on the same topic. But it's like, whoa, let me back up a little bit. If I click the back button, I'm on the man still on the manager level. So the only way I could change perspective is by the top menu bar. The, the way I go back and forward is with the typical next and back buttons. So the JavaScript we have in, uh, in Lectora takes care of all the behind the scenes of programming. And all you got to do is put in your content and the content is going to be different. I'll click on corporate. It's going to be different. So I'm going to go back to designer and click and click and click to the end of the course real quick. And click here to finish. And this is the path that I follow. I click on designer, I switch to programmer, manager a couple of times, corporate, and I finished up with, in the designer point of view. I earned a badge because I completed all the designer pages. I didn't complete all the programmer. I didn't complete all the uh, corporate or manager badges, and, but I did complete the course. So I got one badge for completing the course. I got another badge for, and I could earn a badge for every single one of these my total pages. So you see, I'm tracking a lot of data here. And you can take a little quick little screen capture if you want. But uh, if you want to, if you want to try this on your own that I just breezed through, there's, I, I, I have it also in the PowerPoint. But here's the web address, you can take this. And what, what's really fun is, if you and a colleague go through the course, and you go to the results page, which is right here, you can see I've got hundreds of people have taken this course. In the beginning, what I was doing is I was color coding the completed paths. So everyone who completed the designer was in red, the management was in blue, and so on and so forth. So I have a visual representation of all this data. And if I scroll down to the very bottom, which is quite lengthy here, but here we are. So now on the 19th, I use the name ELBX. We found it from a webinar. I clicked on 14 pages. I earned two badges. And this is the path. This is an awesome amount of data that we're tracking. And it can be done in your authoring tool using 
the learner intelligence adaptive design model. So here's the uh, bit.ly link to the test drive. Here's the bit.ly link to results. It's kind of cool if you do this with a colleague in your company and then compare results. And you might be amazed how you both took the same course, but you followed your own personal paths. And especially if you do that with three or four people, it really becomes apparent. And you can scroll up and down and see that other people followed the paths different from yours. Any questions on this? We do have one question about, so companies are getting much stricter with connecting to Google or other platforms if they're not the company standard. Could you do the same thing, but report it out to a SharePoint list or Smartsheet? To be honest, I have, I have not tried that because I know that uh, Google is very popular, but you know, I'll make a note and see if I can find time to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, Google al allows you to submit data you know, to it. Uh, so if, there, if there's a form in SharePoint that submits uh, data to, you know, to a spreadsheet, uh, then we'd have to be able to just uh, submit that same uh, form data directly instead of going from the form to the, to the, sh to, to the SharePoint uh, spreadsheet. If we could go from the SCORM file to that, you know, that sheet. So that would be the challenge. Okay, we're getting towards the end here. I don't know how I'm doing time-wise, but we do have time for plenty of questions. Lessons learned. Learner actions generates data. And you can and you're gonna see this is extremely logical. I'm a very analytical type of a guy here. Learner actions generates data. Personalized learning creates more actions. So more data is possible when learning is personalized. And we talked about different ways of personalized learning. We talked about the branching. We're talking about the pre-testing, which is very common. And we talked about ways to make it really, really super personalized with tons and tons of choices. And I just showed you a demo of that uh, in action. Data can be sent to Google and maybe to some other sources to track learner performance. The learner intelligence model maximizes personalization, as we just discussed. And if you use Lectora to easily upload data to Google, it's super, super simple, but it can be done with other authoring tools as well. Now, my job here at ELB Learning is I'm a learning solutions engineer. So I love questions like, can this be done? Can that be done? And I don't always have the answer, but sometimes what I do is I start researching and playing around. And if I don't find an answer, sometimes I, I find a workaround. So I love doing this and I love having access to Honestly, you know, world world class authoring tools. So, if you're interested, I encourage you to explore what we have to offer in the studio, as you can see right here. Each one of these tools, like the virtual reality and the gamification platform, they'll generate some data. Also, what's pretty cool about the games, I had a client ask me because I think I got time to mention a little story too. Uh, I had a client ask me, can we? collect some custom data, you know, because we have, uh, we're going to be providing training to uh, people, employees in different groups, and we like, and we like to report on that. And it's like, cool, you can, you could create your own custom fields. So when the, when the user starts up the game, they, I, I built a, I built a game with a little drop down list. So they click the drop down list, they, they picked out what department they were in. And then I thought it was, it was really neat because I got kind of creative and got carried away. I asked them what experience level they had in this topic. Because you know, the game is on is on a, a to topic is on content that the that the company is training on. I go, what's the confidence level? Are you a master, a wizard? Are you a challenger? Are you a hopeful? Are you doomed? <laughs> Meaning, I don't know anything about this topic. That kind of feedback comes out in the game report. And that could be very interesting to gauge how confident your employees are with the content at hand, because if, you know, I mean, that, that kind of data can be tracked without having a survey, without having to ask people bluntly in the face. Are you confident with the data? Uh, um, well, I work for you and I'm, I'm supposed to be. So yeah, 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 I'm confident. No, 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 you know, <laughs> with that drop down, it's a lot easier for people to, you know, be honest. It's not, it's not in their face. So that's a quick example of collecting data from gamification. 
So the gamification, the virtual reality, the video practice, uh, the lectoral course authoring, they all have potentials for uh, generating and collecting data. So I encourage you to explore these. And if you want to learn more, I'll leave this on the slide for a bit, and then I'll ask if any other questions. Here you have a bunch of links to EOB Learning Site. Uh, the blog I mentioned about using Lectora to submit the results of Google, uh, that's in the blog library. Uh, the, the direct link I showed you earlier. We have some res uh, resources up here. Uh, the main ELB Learning uh, website. Lower left-hand corner, a link to my blog page. And I know I haven't updated it in a while, but it's got a ton of information on the uh, learner intelligent ad adaptive design model. Plus there's free templates in Storyline and in Lectora that you could download and play around with. And then last but not least, my contact information. And that's a wrap. Are there any questions or comments? All right, great. Thank you so much, Dominic. We do have a couple of questions and comments. Mm -hmm. So uh, one person says he is currently sending data from a learning module to a Google Doc and then to a Smartsheet. So that is one way that you could get it to end up in there, although he does note that it's a bit cumbersome. And I think if your primary concern is security, your company might not like that middle step of Google, but that's one option. We did have a question earlier about accessibility. And this was when you were showing the adaptive learning, the branch scenario, how accessible is that from a 508 standpoint? Okay, that is an interesting question. So let me go back to, actually let me bring on to the screen. Okay, so let's go back to, so basically for accessibility purposes, the only thing that's different is that you have a menu on every single page. That is the only thing that's different. JavaScript, with Lectora, JavaScript behind the scenes takes care of everything. In Lectora, you're just showing you know, different uh, layers, but all the content would, that you build would be 508 compliant. And as long as these buttons are 508 compliant, which I mean, without a click of a button that's 508 compliant, you'd like dead in the water. So yeah, as long as these buttons are 508 uh, are designed 508 compliant, meaning color wise and with, with, with an audio option as well, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then there's no conflict whatsoever. Okay, that's awesome. Good to know. Um, let's see. I think I think that's all the questions. We did have one. Um, one attendee noted that with AI constantly scraping the internet, their company has become very strict on protecting proprietary information. So that's definitely something to keep in mind as AI becomes more commonly used. Okay. The, the fact that someone brought up AI, you know, because I know something about this. This, this is very interesting. AI is reactive, meaning AI needs data. If you use chat GPT, you know that when you build your prompt, if you say, you know, write me a speech about AI writing speeches, who knows what in the world you're gonna get. But I actually did this because I'm part of Toastmasters. I put in my, my speaking style. I put in some topics that I want included. I put in uh, you know, a lot of information I, about the audience who I was speaking to, how I speak, I want, I want questions, I want a little bit of humor. I put a whole paragraph of instruction, but it wrote me a speech, a five to seven minute speech for Toastmasters. I actually gave it. And I told people at the end that this, this is not my speech, it was written by AI. It was hilarious, but uh, AI is reactive. It needs data, whether it's collecting data on uh, past learners' uh, performance from taking previous courses, from selections that they've made, uh, some LMS systems or have AI built in like as a recommendation engine, but until they know something about the learner, it could be that it's their job role and their hire date, that's some data. It could be how they answer some questions. Uh, and, and then different recommendations are made to, pers to personalize learning. But AI is reactive. 
However, the learning intelligence adaptive design model is, pre, is uh, not reactive, but proactive. Meaning if I'm, I love reading because I can control the pace of the information and the flow of the information. Let's say I'm in a 20 page course and I'm on page nine of a 20 page course. And I've been reading up to this point and it's pretty deep and heavy stuff and I'm tired. And I have an option on the top to switch to video and interactive. I click on video. The same page comes up, but now someone speaks to me in the video. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I click the next button and I'm, and, and I'm watching video. But there's no way, there is absolutely no way an AI platform is going to know that on page nine, Dominic, who his past record has shown that he likes to read and, and view information in a text format, there's no way an AI is going to know that on page nine, I want to uh, switch to a video. If uh, everyone's heard about social learning, so now I'm taking a course and my friend and my coworker comes along and we're both sitting in front of the computer screen. Now we're going through the course and there's options in the course and I'm about to click on an answer and my friend says, well, isn't it the other one? I go, no, it's not the other one. I know that it's not, but I'll prove it to you. I click on the wrong answer. What's AI picking up? AI now starts picking up mixed data, okay? I didn't get the answer wrong, but I'm working. With, I'm, I'm taking the learning with my friend. My friend wa wanted to see what would happen. So, with the social learning and with and with the uh, and if you want to do exploratory learning, mm, I know this is the right answer, but I wonder what kind of response I'm going to get by, by, by clicking on the wrong answer. So AI is powerful, but it's reactive, and the learning intelligent adaptive design model, it it can work with AI. It, it's not one or the other. They could both work together, but I'm off on a tangent. I just wanted to talk about that.